Malachi chapter 2, beginning at verse 17, uh, through to the end of verse 6 of chapter 3, page 850 in your pew Bibles. You've wearied the Lord with your words, yet you ask, how have we wearied the Lord? When you say, everyone who does evil is good in the Lord's sight, and he is pleased with them. Or, where is the God of justice? See, I'm going to send my messenger and he'll clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant you desire. See, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who will be able to stand when he appears? For he'll be like a refiner's fire and like cleansing lye. He'll be like a refiner and purifier of silver. He'll purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Then they'll present offerings to the Lord in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will please the Lord as in days of old and years gone by. I'll come to you in judgment, and I'll be ready to witness against sorcerers and adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the widow and the fatherless and cheat the wage earner, and against those who deny justice to the foreigner. They do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts, because I, Yahweh, have not changed. You descendants of Jacob have not been destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Malachi, as we've said a number of times, is a hard book, but it's a book of grace. And it asks us a number of really important questions. Often God speaks in questions or statements in the book. Uh, Let me begin with one that emerged for me. Uh, Have you ever wondered whether God is actually interested in us as his people? Whether God is really concerned about evil and good amongst his mob? Whether God can be bothered in justice with his people? You might have asked a question or questions like that after the death of someone amongst God's people. You might have asked a question or questions like that when you've read an account of violent persecution somewhere in the world. You might have asked those kind of questions when you've experienced some form of injustice, some slight, even a sneering put-down, perhaps at morning tea. You might have asked those questions as you looked out on the world and watch the rise and success of the obvious evildoer and then looked at the hard work you're pouring in just to make mortgage repayments. The book of Psalms is full of those kind of questions. It's been terrific to work our way through Psalms, reading one every week. Uh, The questions that emerge here and create those poems are questions that God answers. They're questions in the book of Psalms that are asked with the right attitude, eager to hear what God will say. But there are times when those questions are asked and we don't want to listen to the answer, do we? Instead, we ask those questions because we actually fundamentally doubt whether God is of good character, whether God's motives are pure, and whether we can be even being bothered to commit to a God like that. There are moments, perhaps even whole lifetimes, when those questions are asked and the character of God is slandered and the goodness of relationship with him is scoffed at. And when that happens, the question asked is often then reflected in the life an attitude of the question. I mean, if if God doesn't care about justice and evil, why should I? And Malachi deals with that today. Let me pray. Father, thank you for asking us questions. Father, thank you that you speak questions, that you listen to our questions and you give answers. Father, sometimes those questions are uncomfortable. Sometimes when we ask them, we ask them for the wrong reasons, but thankfully you always answer and your answers direct us to the goodness of your nature. Father, remind us of that today in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, God's people have questioned his love. 
Chapter 1, 1 to 5. God's people have offered him their seconds. Chapter 1, 6 to 2, 9. God's people have doubted their identity in him, treating the covenant of marriage with wanton abandon, what we looked at last week. And in each instance, the foundation, the vertical and the horizontal, God's people have shown their disregard for the covenant he has with them. He, he, he is faithful, isn't he? He's unrelenting in his love. He deserves his people's devotion. He's given them an identity as his children which they do not deserve. Even the fact that they can stand there, having come back from exile, and even ask the questions shows that he still loves them. And now they weary him by questioning his character. Verse 17, you've wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you ask, how have we wearied him? When you say everyone who does evil is good in the Lord's sight and he's pleased with them, or or where is the God of justice? Remember the structure of Malachi? Here it is again. Uh, There's an accusation from God against his people. They respond and then he brings the application. The, The accusation here is clear. I'm tired of your words. Now God doesn't grow tired. Read Psalm 121. The the tiring thing here, the wearying thing here is the nagging and the whining and the whinging of the natter and the gossip of people who doubt the love of God and whether he's actually committed to them. It's the relational wearying of an unfaithful partner. And they don't understand. How have we done that, God? And so God repeats to them their questions. Uh, The first one there in verse 17 describes God as someone who's contradictory in nature. Uh, When God's people look out amongst God's people, those who do evil seem to get ahead in life. And God gives that a two thumbs up. Uh, The second set of words there in verse 17 describe a God who's disinterested at best, absent or negligent at worst when it comes to justice in the world. As God reminds his people of those wearisome words, worth remembering just three very simple truths about Malachi at this point. First, remember the context for Malachi is a covenant, a binding agreement between two or more people with obligations on both sides. The covenant is between God and his people. They're bound together in commitment to each other. And they're meant to display him to the world. Second, in this context, God's people are consistently revealed as doubting God, disbelieving God, doubting whether he is true to what he says. Chapter 1, 1 to 5, you don't really love us, God. Chapter 1, 6 to 2, 9, God, you only deserve my seconds, not my firsts. Chapter 2, verses 10 to 16, well, If the covenant isn't worth it, why should I bother in the covenant of marriage in my life? The nature of God is being questioned. The nature of God, his character, who he is at his core, is being questioned, doubted and maligned by his people. Oh God, you approve evil and call it good. You're so contradictory. Thirdly, Malachi's words are spoken to God's people. It's a book for the insiders. It's confronting God's mob. It's it's not about the world out there. Plenty of other books in the Bible deal with how evil the world out there is. This book is dealing with God's people. Uh, Malachi is not confronting evil and injustice in the wider world. We'll get to that in a moment in the application. Malachi is confronting evil and injustice within the people of God, in the very mob who are meant to be bound to him and show him to the world. Can you see there how God's people are doubting his nature and his character? What would God do about this? What would you do about this if you were God? God's response is very clear. I'm at point three on the outline. Look there in verse one. See, I'm going to send my messenger. He'll clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant you desire. See, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. 
God himself now speaks in. Not through a mouthpiece, God himself steps in and he makes one thing crystal clear. I'm coming. I'm coming. I will come and walk amongst you. The temple will not be a symbol of what I desire. No, I will actually come and live with you. Live with you as my people. I'm not going to surprise you. I'll send a messenger to get the way ready because I am a gracious and kind and generous God. So you are ready for my coming. Again, notice that the focus is on the people of God. God's not coming to deal with the world. God's coming to his mob, to live with them, to deal with them. You see, God's not disinterested, is he? He's intensely personal and interested in his people. His mob should have known this already. God always does what he promises. He's always concerned about his people. Remember his promise to remove them if they were unfaithful? They've just come back from exile. The fact that they even stand there with a mini temple and shrunken borders, the fact that they can even stand there and cast slurs on his nature, that shows he cares because they haven't been wiped out. And when this God comes to his mob, what what will it be like? Look there in verse 2. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who will be able to stand when he appears? For he'll be like a refiner's fire, like cleansing lye. God has appeared like this once before, hasn't he? Uh, in Exodus chapters 33 to 34, to a man described as the friend of God. Remember Moses? And God said, I'll pass before you, Moses, and you'll hear my name, which is my nature, but because I love you, I'm actually going to put you into that crevice in a rock, and you're actually not going to look at me face to face, because if you did, you would be destroyed. And so Moses only catches a glimpse Because no one can stand when the Lord comes in his presence face to face. Not on that day. On that day when the Lord comes, no one can bear it on their own. It will be a day of judgment unlike any other. Did you see that there in verse 2? And see how... God himself is described in verse 3. He'll be like a refiner and purifier of silver. He'll purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Then they will present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. The Lord Lord is interested. He's not absent. He's not negligent. He's not disinterested. What's he interested in? He's interested in purifying his mob. How hot do you have to make a fire to purify gold? That's God. How much do you have to scrub the dirty washing with lime and soap to get rid of the stains? That's God. The Lord is interested. He's interested in restoring the very covenant that he is committed to with his mob. And he's going to start with them. And you notice who he's going to start with amongst them? Did you notice that there? He's going to start with the ones who've led them astray, the leadership, the sons of Levi, the priests. Remember them from chapter 2, the ones who should have taught God's people, the ones who should have led God's people. The Lord is interested and he's going to come to his mob and he's going to purify his mob and he's going to begin with the leadership, with the teachers and the ones who lead. The Lord is interested. He'll come. And the Lord knows evil and good. And he'll deal with that amongst his people so that they are restored. And it won't just be about purifying. It'll be about judgment. I'm at point four on the outline. Look there in verse five. I'll come to you in judgment. I'll be ready to witness against sorcerers and adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the widow, the fatherless, cheat the wage earner, against those who deny justice to the foreigner. They don't fear me, says the Lord of hosts. It'll be a day of judgment when God judges his people. Do you notice who God's coming to there in verse five? To you, to God's people, 
He's not coming to the wider world at this point. That, that will happen. The God of justice, Israel, he's interested and he'll come to deal with the sin of his people. You see, because God's mob doubt his love, uh, because they don't think he's worth it, because they won't display his identity amongst them, because they think he's not really interested, because they think that he's not concerned about justice, evil and good, they don't care about it. They don't care about it. They dabble in alternative gods, that's sorcery. They indulge in sexual adventure and indulgence, that's adultery. They do not speak the truth face to face but peddle in lies and break promises, they swear falsely. They don't care for the defenceless, the widow and the fatherless. They are economically exploitative and they don't pay what people deserve and when it comes to the foreigner they couldn't care less. That's nothing like the God who made them. The God who is always truthful. The God who is always faithful. The God who never breaks his promises. The God who looks out for those who need mercy and have no defence. The God in whose image every human being is made. The God who is always fair and just. They should be representing this God. But because they doubt him, they then reflect the sin in their own hearts. And so he's going to come. He's going to judge their sin. They do not fear him, but they'll see it. In fact, the mere fact that they can speak words shows his mercy. Look there in verse 6, because I, Yahweh, have not changed. You descendants of Jacob have not been destroyed. That... Their mere existence shows his commitment. Did God do as he promised? I'm at point five on the outline. Well, certainly a bloke called Mark thought he did, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. Do you see how he begins his biography of Jesus? And he quotes Isaiah 40 and Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, Did God do as he promised? Well, uh, certainly a bloke called Jesus seems to have thought so. Matthew chapter 11, as these men went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. That's John the Baptist. This is the one it is written about. Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you. He'll prepare your way before you. Do you see again the quote from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1? Both Mark and Jesus are very clear. God kept his word. The messenger has come. What's his name? John the Baptist. So what did John do? John walked around like a prophet, like Malachi, preparing people for someone greater who was coming. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. There is someone coming, John said, who will judge you, who will deal with the sin of God's people. And, and who followed very closely after John the Baptist? was Jesus, was it? And so if you follow the logic of Malachi 3, 1 and 2, that means Jesus is who? The Lord come to his mob. Jesus is God come to his people to live. John chapter 1, Jesus is God who comes to his very own house. Luke chapter 2, Jesus is God who's come to judge the sin of his people. Matthew 23, beginning with the leadership. But Jesus is more than that. He's at least that, but he's more. Jesus is also the display of the relentless love of God for his people. Jesus is everything God's people should have been. Don't assume that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And when Jesus came to do that, Jesus displayed God perfectly. No one's ever seen God, the one and only Son, the one who is at the Father's side. He's revealed him. If you know me, you'll also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And when Jesus came to do those things, he gave to God the one offering God deserved. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. And when Jesus did that, 
God judged sin in his people, didn't he? Literally. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And when that took place, Christ suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. God did exactly as he promised. See, I'm coming, and he sent a messenger, and then he came, and he judged the sin in his own people. And when he did that, 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 and 10, he created a whole new priesthood who was meant to go out into the world to sing the praises of God. God is interested, and he takes sin seriously. He is relentless in his love for his people, and he judges the sin in his people. And yet here we are. At the last, last point on the outline, here, here we are. <laughs> there is still evil and sin amongst God's people. Right wages are not paid. The poor, the widow, the defenceless and the foreigner are not stood up for. Here we are where adultery and sexual immorality is accepted amongst the leadership of God's people. Remember General Synod last year where lies can be peddled and promises not kept. And and I wonder whether we wonder whether God is still interested. What are we to do with Malachi today? It seems very similar. Let me finish with four very simple observations. First, be assured of this. God is interested, isn't he? Remember how we talked about his love? In chapter 1, 1 to 5, and remember how we looked at an empty cross and we walked through an empty tomb and we saw that God's love had judged sin on whom? On Jesus. God is interested and he does bring judgment for sin and his love is shown in that he visits it on his son. That is his relentless love. And so he's created a people for himself, people called us to represent him in the world, to show him as he truly is. So secondly, let's be careful with our words and our hearts. It's okay to ask these questions, but as we ask them, let's desire an answer. Let's phrase them so we do not slander the name and character of God, but we uphold it. Because remember, we've got a job to do. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, we are to represent God to the world. And so we're to represent his character, a character that is faithful to the covenant and the covenants, a character that is just and truthful, a character that cares for the defenceless and the poor and the widow and the foreigner a character that pays justly and generously and graciously. We are to represent God to the world by singing his praises and reflecting his nature because, fourthly, there is a day still to come and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea existed no longer. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, look, God's dwelling is with men. Does that sound familiar? He will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will exist no longer. Grief, crying and pain will exist no longer because the previous things have passed away. And then the one seated on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. Does that sound familiar? He also said, right, because these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, it's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the thirsty from the spring of living water as a gift. The victor will inherit these things. I'll be his God. He'll be my son. But the cowards, unbelievers, vile, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, And all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. There will be a day 
the day of final judgment, which will be eternal, and it will start with the people of God and their leadership. Do not doubt it. God has shown his interest. He has judged the sin of his people in his Son, and he now calls for us to represent him faithfully until that day comes. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that Malachi was clear, that you are clear through Malachi. Father, thank you that in Jesus you have judged the sin of your people. Father, thank you that you have purified us to represent you faithfully to the world. Father, please equip us to do that. Transform our hearts and desires. Move from our heads to our hands and our hearts so that we show you faithfully to the world and others come to see you as the personally interested God who cares about justice and injustice, who cares about good and evil, right and wrong, and displays that in his Son. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions? It's a really good question. So when we think things in our hearts and we raise questions with God, does that affect God in his plans and in his purposes? Have I, have I heard that correctly, Elsie? Yep. So that's why I think Malachi is so helpful because what does Malachi begin with in chapter 1, verses 1 to 5? Can anyone remember? It's not rhetorical. Anyone can answer. begins with his love. What does he say right there at the beginning? I love you. You've just come back from exile. What do I, I love you. Uh, So God's plans and desires are never changed by what his people do. He responds to them, but they're the response of a God who doesn't change. We got that there in verse 6. You haven't been destroyed because I don't change. So we can raise our questions with God. There's the whole book of Psalms there, which is a whole lot of questions. Psalm 73 is a corker for that. And we can listen to God respond And then God can rebuke us in his love, but his purposes do not change. Neither does his covenant with his people. Does that answer your question a little bit?